Hey, thanks everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes? Okay, cool. So um, I'm going to be talking to you today about the exploration and exploitation trade-off in sequential decision making. Uh, so the first half of the talk, uh, I'm sorry to say, will be a lot of review of um, some frameworks for sequential decision making, in particular multi-arm bandits and uh, Markov decision processes. So I know many of you may be familiar with these already, but I just want to make sure everyone um, is on the same page. And also, in doing that, I will uh, introduce some of the notation and uh, and and in, uh, in, in notation that I'll be using in the second half of the talk, where I talk about um, our work on uh, our our ongoing project on. Um, tuning exploration in, in these problems. Um, and I just want to say up front that it is very much an, uh, a work in progress. So um, I'm very excited to hear uh, people's um, feedback and criticisms and questions so that we can, we can clarify our, our thinking here. Um, but uh, yeah. So first I'll talk about uh, multi-arm bandits and Markov decision processes. Uh, and then I'll review um, strategies for solving the exploration uh, for addressing the exploration exploitation problem in particular, and then we'll talk about our uh, proposed algorithm or family of algorithms and show uh, results of a small simulation study on some uh, uh, in, in mHealth inspired simulations and then uh, some con concluding remarks. Okay, um, so just uh, for concreteness, uh, I'm sure you folks know what I mean when I say sequential decision problem, but just this is going to be our, our running example so, so that I'm, I'm not talking so abstractly all the time. Uh, uh, one example of a sequential decision problem uh, comes from this uh, study, this mobile health study of patients with type 1 diabetes. Um, and they, uh, these patients wore uh, these continuous glucose monitors as well as accelerometers. Uh, uh, Insulin also logged their insulin uh, injection histories with digital insulin pump logs and also took food logs, maybe on the mobile phone. Um, so this was, uh, again, a mobile health study uh, trying to um, uh, study the effects of uh, recommendations to um, give insulin rec or, or recommend insulin physical activity and or food at each time point. And I think the time points were... Uh, every so many hours during the day or something like this. And uh, the goal was to keep glucose levels in the normal range, of course, right? So um, uh, this is sort of a, a qualitative description of a particular sequential decision problem. And this is actually, uh, the, the data from this study will actually be the basis for our, our simulation. Um, okay, so uh, as for the, what, what I mean when I say the exploration and exploitation trade-off, when, whenever we make a sequence of decisions under uncertainty, we face a choice between uh, acting on our current best guess at what the, the, the best action to take is, uh, and acting in order to gain more accurate beliefs, because we know we, we have some uncertainty in our beliefs about the best decision to make. Um, so we know that we could, we could uh, improve our beliefs and so uh, maybe take better actions in the future. So, uh, we're, I'm going to focus on the cases where uh, the goal of a sequential decision problem is to maximize uh, some cumulative reward uh, where cumulative where reward is understood in terms of, say, patient outcomes. Uh, so this is uh, as opposed to, um, say, the design of a sequential experiment where we also, or, where exploration is also of primary interest. Uh, However, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that what I say is also adaptable to uh, cases where we also want to optimize the design of a, uh, a sequential study in order to maximize some criterion of, of, of informativeness. Okay, uh, so what motivates the work that, uh, that we did in particular? So uh, common heuristics for, for, for solving this exploration, exploitation, dilemma, and reinforcement learning are one, designed for infinite horizon problems, and two, uh, they disregard knowledge of system dynamics uh, because uh, when I say that, I mean that they typically don't attempt to model the entire system that they're working in. Um, uh, and this is often because 
Uh, reinforcement learning is often applied to uh, problems in engineering and robotics and game playing where there is a need to make split second decisions and so computational efficiency is very important and so uh, people typically have to get away with uh, heuristics that allow um, some trading off of exploration and exploitation uh, very quickly. Um, on the other hand, in some applications, including perhaps some mHealth applications, uh, time horizons are relatively short, uh, in which case justifications for infinite horizon heuristics may fail. Uh, in particular, you can imagine that uh, when, uh, when you know the time horizon of a decision problem, um, and you're approaching that time, the, the end of the problem, uh, you know that the value of information is decreasing for you, right? Uh, so, so at the very last time point of a decision problem, there's actually no value of, of exploring uh, uh, because it, you, you can't exploit any information that you would gain by exploring later on. Uh, so, um, so that's one, one shortcoming of infinite horizon justifications for, oops, for methods. Uh, and uh, second, second difference uh, with common reinforcement learning problems is that uh, statistical efficiency may take precedence over computational efficiency. Uh, so we may be in a setting where uh, we have minutes or hours or days or weeks to uh, do the computing necessary to come to make the next decision. Um, so if, 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 there is, if there is more information in our data that we can use to make, to, to approach the exploration problem in a, in a more intelligent way, uh, it might be, it might be uh, worth it to do that. Okay, so our contribution or our, uh, uh, I don't know how confident I am to call it a contribution yet. Our current project is on uh, 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 coming up with a simple heuristic for uh, tuning the amount of exploration in sequential decision problems. Okay, and we do lot leverage knowledge of the underlying generative model as well as the time horizon. I should be timing this. Okay, so uh, this is the beginning of the review, but I will introduce some notation that I'll be using when we talk about the, the, the new stuff. Okay, so uh, a generic sequential decision-making problem uh, are characterized by one, a reward function, and reward functions measure how good uh, states of the world are to the decision maker, basically. Uh, there's a set of available actions at each time step. The, there is an environment governed by unknown probability distributions. So in our glucose example, what I mean by an environment governed by unknown probability distributions are, for instance, the distribution over uh, uh, the value of your next glucose level given uh, your current activity level and food intake and whether you've got an insulin shot and so on. So that's one of the, that's one conditional probability distribution that characterizes the glucose problem. And our goal is to maximize some measure of cumulative expected reward over the course of the decision problem. Okay, and, and in more complicated models, uh, we can just keep adding structure to this, this generic setup. So in more complicated models, the reward distributions may also <coughs> depend on states or contexts, as some, some folks have called them. Uh, and they also may be dependent over time. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about a, a quite simple um, uh, example which uh, just has these ingredients. That's the multi arm bandit. And then we're going to talk about a more complicated uh, state and time dependent uh, process called the Markov decision process. And then contextual bandits are, are kind of in between. Uh, so they're state dependent but in de time independent. And uh, throughout, I'll be using the notation, our time horizon is going to be T, which is finite, because we're interested in short hor horizon problems. Uh, we take an action at each time step T uh, in some action space script A. Uh, we get a re uh, resulting reward UT. So Susan was using UT, so you take action at time T, and you get reward UT plus one, because the rewards come after the action. So for me, uh, you take the action at time t and then you get the reward at time t, but this is the reward resulting from the action at the same time. And then uh, the environment is characterized by some generative model, which is what I vaguely refer to as a, a unknown probability distributions, and then I will, I'll give concrete examples of what this generative model is, but the reason I emphasize this is because we're actually gonna be estimating this in order to tune the exploration. Okay, so multi-arm bandits. Um, 
Okay, so in this setting, the, they, they call the actions arms. So uh, how it works is at each time point, uh, you have a K arms that you can pull, and each of the arms corresponds to a distribution of rewards. So you pull the arm, a reward is drawn, drawn from the corresponding unknown reward distribution, uh, and your goal is to maximize the, uh, the uh, cumulative reward over the decision, prop, of the decision horizon. Um, so in this case, the generative model M is just the reward distributions corresponding to each arm. This means that at each uh, time point, you take an action A, and you get to, you draw a reward from the corresponding distribution. And then we're going to denote the uh, means of each arm uh, as mu. And uh, again, we're going to emphasize that they depend on uh, this generative model. Uh, and the reason the means are important, because the best you can do in expectation is, uh, is t times the, the highest mean. Right? Uh, um. Okay, and then we're just going to call the, the, the histories of actions rewards uh, bold A, bold U, and, and bold H is, is all of them together. All right, and uh, the goal is to take a sequence of actions which maximizes the expected cumulative reward, uh, which I'm going to call V. Uh, people often talk about a regret, which is uh, just as the, be the, the best you could possibly do minus the value of what you actually do. Uh, but they're maximizing this is the same as minimizing regret. I just, uh, I, I'm using uh, cumulative reward as opposed to regret um, to make the notation consistent with what I'm, I'm going to talk about later. So that's the only reason. And uh, because, again, because we don't know M, we have to trade off learning about M, exploring, and acting according to our current estimates of each mu, which is exploiting. Okay. Uh, all right, so this is, uh, I'm not super happy with this notation or terminology, but, but it is what it is. So we're, we define an exploration strategy uh, is, a, is basically an algorithm that's going to tell us what to do at each time point, given our total information state. Um, and I call it an exploration strategy because um, we've argued kind of heuristically that we're going to need to build in some exploration into our decision making. So uh, this is a sequence of maps from the histories at each time point, which encode basically your knowledge of the decision problem at that time, uh, to a probability distribution over, over actions. Now, this is distinct from uh, a policy. So if you, in, in the, the typical usage at least, so if those of you who, are, who have worked in, in Markov decision processes know that um, uh, people will talk about the optimal policy in a, in a dependent decision problem. So a policy maps not the entire uh, information state or not the entire history of observations, but your current state to an action. So that's, that's not what this is. And indeed, an exploration strategy, as I'm talking about it, may involve estimating the optimal policy and then combining it with some heuristic for exploration. Does that, is, does this distinction make sense? I just want to make sure because um, this, this given given the state that you're in. Um, no, you're not assuming the state spade captures the history, right? Um, so the in a policy, right? So the policy does just depend on the state, right? And if you knew the optimal policy in an MDP, you would know exactly what to do. There would be no question of choosing an exploration strategy, right? So we introduced the exploration strategy because because we don't know the dynamics of the system, right? Right, so we have to have some algorithm for deciding what to do, despite the fact that we don't know what the dynamics are, right? And it's an exploration strategy because that algorithm has to encode some some heuristic for exploring. Right. 
Yeah. As you look at it, you can see it says false with an extra trust. Right. I'm trying to catch what you can understand. I think one thing you're saying is I'm going to go for an extra trust instead of false because you'll get all those things. Yeah. I think there's something else you can say, which is when you're thinking of it's a way of authentication of the false is by specifically representing how we use the law. No, so so I mean you can call this a policy if you want, but then I don't know what to call pi in an MDP. This is um, so maybe can I can I get to this example, and then maybe this will this will make it clear, and then if that doesn't answer your question, to come back. Okay, so a simple example of what I mean by an exploration strategy is the epsilon greedy algorithm, right? So the epsilon greedy says, for a certain sequence of, of epsilons at each time point t, do the following. With probability one minus epsilon over the num number of actions, take the arm, pull the arm with the highest sample mean. And then otherwise, act uniformly at random. Okay. Right? So the optimal policy in a multi-arm bandit is to pull the arm with the highest mean at every step, right? But we don't know what the generative model is. So that's why we introduced, introduced this notion of a, an exploration strategy, right? And this is not novel. I mean, this is just what I'm calling it to kind of unify the different algorithms I'm going to be talking about. Does this, this is an, this is, it's an important uh, thing to clarify. So I want to make sure that we're on the same page now. Okay, so just think of, when, when I say exploration strategy, just think epsilon greedy, Thompson sampling, UCB, those are all classes of exploration strategies. Okay. Okay, policy learning. Okay, so, if we knew, if we knew the generative model M, uh, well, okay, well, let me, let me back up. Just, just, uh, up. the optimal exploration strategy over a class G of exploration strategies is just the one that maximizes value when followed. Okay, so if we knew, uh, if we knew the generative model, uh, then we could just pick, um, we could just pick the optimal exploration strategy uh, to follow. Of course, if we knew the generative model, um, we would just pull the highest mean arm at each time step. Um, there, there's a reason I'm introducing this, and it's because I'm, we're going to be uh, mimicking this um, by estimating the model later on. All right. um, and then more generally, if we're uncertain about the model, um, we can optimize the same objective um, integrated against some uh, posterior or sampling distribution or whatever over um, over the model space. Uh, and again, this is just kind of foreshadowing where our algorithm is going to be doing. Okay, so that's it for bandits. Uh, and I'm mainly introducing bandits because they make it easy to talk about the, ex the, uh, the exploration strategies that I'm gonna be talking about later, and then those can easily be uh, adapted to MDPs. Okay, uh, MDPs. So MDPs uh, are, a generalization of bandits in a couple of ways. Uh, first, uh, the environment is also characterized by a state at each time step. So the glucose, uh, we'll actually see the glucose example I gave at the beginning as an example of an MDP, um, where, where uh, the state at each time step is some summary of your recent uh, uh, insulin use, or, or sorry, um, activity level and food intake. And glucose level. Uh, all right, so the state evolves to Markovian transi transition probabilities, which means that uh, the probability distribution over, um, uh, or, or the probabilities over the next state uh, depend only on uh, the current state in action. And then now, now in general, we can have the reward function depend both on the state as well as the action. So in the glucose example, uh, the reward function is gonna be some measure of, of how far your glucose is from the normal range. Uh, 
Okay, and I just talk about this again, but I, I actually want to write down the MDP this time. So uh, the actions are uh, to give insulin or not. So the actions are, are just in zero, 01. I think in the original study, they, the, the decision was also to recommend insulin, I mean, uh, recommend uh, uh, activity or in food intake as well. But just for simplicity, the action is binary. And uh, writing uh, XT as glucose uh, diet, um, uh, DI for dietary diet or, or food intake, exercise, and the action. Uh, glucose levels are modeled as an AR2 process. Uh, so you'll notice that this, uh, this is not an MT MDP with respect to these Xs because you have dependence on the past two time steps. But if you, um, but, uh, if you condition on the past two time steps, say, um, glucose, food intake, and exercise from the past, uh, currently and then at the last like four hours ago or however often they, me uh, they measured it, then if this model is correct, this is, a, this is an MDP. Um, and I, I, I messed up the notation a little bit, so states are distinct from actions, so the X's should actually just be, if we want to call the state at time t, x, t, and x, t minus one, they should just be these three bits, and then the action will be, will be separate. But, uh, right, so this is, uh, Real life MDP. Okay, so uh, back to the policy exploration strategy thing. Uh, so a policy is a sequence of decision rules mapping states to probability distributions over actions. Uh, and so I just call probability, the set of probability distributions over actions delta A. Um, uh, so the uh, policy value function measures the cumulative expected reward uh, when you follow policy pi, right? So this is the, uh, this is the analog of uh, the value function that we saw earlier for, for bandits. Uh, it's script V now, because I, I used V a few times and I didn't want to overload it too much. Uh, and if we, uh, if we knew M, we would know the optimal thing to do at each step, which would be pi opt, the argmax of, of script V. Okay. Um, so what is typically done uh, to, to construct an exploration strategy is to uh, uh, treat the time horizon as infinite, estimate the optimal, optimal policy, which is in that case stationary. So there's just one rule that says uh, wherever you are, um, oh, sorry, sorry, given your state, it tells you exactly what to do up to the probability distribution regardless of the time. Uh, Again, if the time horizon is infinite, so you estimate that that stationary infinite horizon policy, um, and then combine it with some exploration heuristic like epsilon greedy. Okay, so uh, just a brief review of exploration heuristics. Uh, so uh, first, I'll say that we we de-emphasize de the theoretical analysis of uh, exploration strategies. Regret, by which I mean. Don't talk about it at all. Uh, but uh, the reason, um, well, there's been a ton of work go that has gone into um, characterizing uh, the, the asymptotic behavior of these different strategies in terms of regret. Um, so we take a different point of view. We, we view these, these particular classes of strategies, epsilon greedy, uh, epsilon greedy, Thompson sampling, UCB, and so on, as uh, tuning parameters. Uh, so we will. Um, uh, we will decide uh, uh, what strategy to use in the parameters of that strategy based on this, this tuning algorithm that I'm going to talk about rather than these asymptotic arguments. Um, that said, you, you could, and indeed we want to eventually study the asymptotic properties of our meta decision-making procedure. Uh, but right now we're not going to talk about it. Okay, and then for simplicity I'll just talk about how you would do this in the context of bandits, uh, and then these are easily ported to MDPs, as I said earlier. Uh, I think yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so we already saw epsilon greedy. Epsilon greedy trades off exploration and exploitation in a very naive way. Uh, it says. 
do what you think is optimal, say take the sample mean with probability one minus epsilon over the number of actions, and then uh, act uniformly at random otherwise. Uh, so epsilon quantifies the uh, exploration exploitation trade-off in this case. And you'll notice that in, in the, each of this, the uh, heuristics that I present, I will emphasize its dependence on some parameter that controls the exploration exploitation trade-off, because uh, that's what we're going to be tuning later. Okay, so that's epsilon greedy. Uh, another is uh, upper confidence bounds. So uh, upper confidence bounds say qualitatively, uh, do the thing, um, act according to optimistic estimates of the value of each of my actions, rather than uh, the, the sample means. Uh, so in particular, uh, we construct a one minus alpha upper confidence bound for the value of each arm, uh, and uh, maximize uh, that confidence bound, uh, rather than the sample means. So in this case, alpha, the confidence level of the bound, controls the exploration exploitation trade-off. And of course, this is going to, the, the confidence bound, regardless of alpha, is going to concentrate on the true value as you gain information, right? So uh, it'll, it'll naturally exploit more over time. Uh, okay, and finally, just want to talk about three common ones. We have Thompson sampling, where you have a posterior distribution over the values of your arms. You draw from that posterior distribution and you maximize, uh, uh, you take the, the highest mean from that posterior draw. Um, and again, this is going to concentrate on, uh, because your posteriors will concentrate on the true values over time, you'll uh, ex exploit more and explore less as you become more confident in the truth. Uh, now you'll notice that there's no, there's no uh, parameter here controlling the exploration exploitation trade-off, right? That's all done by the, that's all taken care of by the posterior. Uh, but we are free, if we'd like, to modify the uh, posterior distribution and, uh, inter and uh, instead draw from some uh, modified posterior, which I'll, I'll call P uh, semicolon tau, so the, the, where the parameter tau controls the spread of the posterior, right? So if your uh, prior, uh, sorry, if your posterior distribution is a normal distribution, so say you're, you have a, you're in a Gaussian bandit setting and uh, you have a normal posterior on the means, uh, you can, uh, oh, I didn't, I didn't even write out this exact example, but um, it's more concrete than this. So you can just scale the variance of those, that posterior by tau, uh, and control um, the exploration exploitation trade-off in that manner. Uh, another thing that, that has actually been done uh, in, uh, in this, uh, this simulation study of Thompson sampling by uh, these folks was uh, they, were, they were studying uh, Thompson sampling's performance in the case of uh, Bernoulli bandits. So you pull an arm and you just get zero or one according to some unknown probability. And so they have a, they have a beta posterior over the uh, Bernoulli parameters for each arm. So they say, you know, why not, instead of, instead of uh, uh, drawing from beta alpha, alpha beta, which where alpha beta are the, uh, the actual posterior parameters, why not scale it by, by tau? And in this case, tau was large, so this, this shrunk the, the posteriors and made them exploit more. And they, uh, for whatever, whatever it's worth, observed that this actually worked uh, better, but they didn't. They didn't try to tune it or, or give any theoretical analysis of this. It was just an interesting observation. So anyway, modified Thompson sampling says, given a sequence of these taus and a way of um, constructing a modified posterior, we can just draw from that that modified that sequence of modified posteriors instead and take actions accordingly. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And there are many ways of doing that. So Eric wants to uh, truncate the distribution. Uh, so he actually wants to say, say, cut off the tails of the distribution uh, and only sample from, from the body. Um, so whereas this is, a, this is a more smooth way of doing it. But you know, there, as I say, there are many ways of doing it. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you saying this is something you actually do? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I can send you um, what I have, and I'd be be curious to hear what it's, read anything you have as well. So cool to see that hear that you're actually doing that. Um, okay. So uh, the upshot of all this is that we have these. Uh, oh wait. Before I say the upshot, there's a there's tons of these these strategies. So um, Thompson sampling and UCB in particular are quite are quite commonly used and and well studied, especially UCB. Uh, but there are a few other classes of strategies that I, I just want to name uh, in, in the interest of being a little more thorough. Uh, so one is the Bayes optimal strategy, uh, which says, you know, I can be fully Bayesian. I have a posterior over uh, the gener generative model, and I can actually just take the action that maximizes my, the posterior expected value of my cumulative returns, uh, assuming that I will follow that policy at every step. Right? Um, so that is actually, uh, in general, a, an intractable planning problem. Because uh, you say, uh, given, given all the data I can have, and then all, of the, uh, all the data I can observe at this step, uh, and all of the resulting posteriors, what would I do? And then you, you propagate that forward, or in a finite horizon setting, you might propagate backward, backward but either way, it's a, generally an intractable thing to do exactly. Uh, you might have heard of the Gittins index strategy, which in certain simple bandit problems actually gives a tractable algorithm for doing this. Uh, but otherwise, um, people, people have studied uh, uh, approximations and uh, ways of oops, doing this with Monte Carlo tree search and things like this. Uh, but I like, I like Bayes optimal at least as a way of thinking about it because it builds in the exploration exploitation trade-off directly into the decision-making procedure, right? It, if, you, if you could do it and you believed that you ought to be Bayesian in the first place, then it, it just tells you exactly what to do. Um, and it, it quantifies the, the value of information in an exact way. Um, okay, so other things that people are really interested in in the, like, mach the computer science machine learning, uh, deep reinforcement learning world are curiosity and intrinsic motivation, uh, which says, um, let's make the agent intrinsically value learning about the environment by giving them some bonus for, um, for say, uh, uh, decreasing the KL divergence between their new posterior and their, their posterior and their prior or whatever. And then there's also entropy regularization, uh, which basically says uh, instead, of, um, instead of maximizing a value function, maximize a value function but also uh, give a bonus for having policies that are that spread probability mass more evenly over the action space. So I just I just wanted to let you guys know about a few other strategies, but we're just going to be talking about the first three. Okay, and now our algorithm. Uh, okay, all right. So. Um, we, we saw three examples of algorithms which uh, are, uh, are, are families of algorithms which are parameterized by uh, parameters controlling the exploration exploitation trade-off. Uh, so we're just going to call eta a generic uh, parameter, so epsilon, alpha, or tau, depending on which setting we're in. Um, and we're going to parameterize these, the sequence of etas by a family of functions increasing uh, in the remaining time, which is big T minus the current time. Um, so for, in, for given the time horizon and the current time and this parameter theta, this is going to tell us the exploration parameter to use. Uh, so as an example of this, uh, you might use this family of sigmoid functions, which uh, for the, this is for epsilon. So it starts off really high 
this, this particular one starts off really high and only at the end begins to exploit. And this one starts off with a lower exploration rate and about halfway through becomes completely exploitative. And then this one is also pretty much just exploits the whole way through. Um, so these are, these are for three different values of the parameter theta. This is one class of exploration schedules. Okay, so we have some family of exploration schedules uh, indexed by theta. Each of these leads to an exploration strategy, uh, which we will call uh, gamma sub theta, which just says at each time point, I uh, use the exploration <coughs> rule with, uh, with parameter eta of t minus t theta. And finally, this gives us a whole family of exploration algorithms uh, as theta varies over some parameter space. All right, um, so uh, uh, for, I said define for multi-arm bandits, but we can actually talk about, oh no, this is for multi-arm bandits in particular. All right, so let's define the, the cumulative expected value when the true generative model is M of following the um, exploration strategy index by theta. So, this, this, so this, is, this is how well you expect to do under model M when you follow uh, the strategy um, given by theta. Uh, and we can just construct a plug-in estimator of the, the optimal exploration strategy by uh, solving this objective uh, at that plug-in estimator. This should be a max, not a min. Um, now, this is not a good idea, um, basically because um, your estimates of the generative model will be too particularly bad uh, in the early stages of your problem, and so may make you badly overconfident uh, and explore much less than you ought to. Um, in particular, if, say, you're in a two-arm bandit setting and the means are actually quite close together, in which case the best thing to do is explore a lot, uh, but your estimates are noisy, so you might think the means are far apart. Uh, and this might cause you to exploit not only at that, that first round, uh, but because you're exploiting then, you'll, uh, you'll, continue, um, you'll continue to be stuck in the suboptimal policy the whole way through. Uh, so one way of mitigating this is instead uh, solve the objective integrated against some uh, uncertainty distribution over, over the uh, space of models. I'm using uncertainty distribution instead of posterior because I don't want to commit myself to, to just Bayesian methods, right? There might be reasonable um, uh, applications of, you know, asymptotic sampling, approximate sampling distributions, or bootstrap distributions, and indeed uh, we use a, 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 um, a non-parametric uh, uh, conditional density estimator later on that it's difficult to get a posterior for because um, we, we didn't want to do non-parametric Bayes, but we can just easily bootstrap to get an uncertainty distribution over that. Anyway, uh, we can solve this smoothed uh, objective uh, to get an estimator of the optimal strategy in that class. And then uh, the rest after that is, is simple. So I, I wrote it in out an algorithm notation, but basically the algorithm is at each time step, estimate the model and, uh, and get your, uh, your uncertainty distribution, however you want to do that, uh, solve the objective, and then act according to the exploration strategy, uh, the recommendation of the estimated exploration strategy at that time point. Okay. Uh, so that's it for the, the algorithm. Uh, I just, we did, we did, we have many simulation studies running, but the only one that's really complete is this, uh, this glucose example, and it's also maybe most pertinent, so uh, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, we use the class of uh, explorations uh, or decay schedules, the, the ADA, the function class for ADA, uh, the, this logistic form that I talked about earlier. Um, now, this is not an easy optimization problem um, because you have, to, you have to, for each value of theta and each value of m tilde, you have to compute this, cumulative, this expected cumulative reward under the corresponding strategy and model. 
Um, so uh, you have to, for each of these, you have to compute a Monte Carlo ex, uh, estimate of this expectation and then do it for many values of theta. Uh, so we, we experiment a little bit with uh, stochastic approximation methods, but we found that uh, Gaussian process optimization worked best. So Gaussian process optimization uh, or Bayesian optimization is a nice way of handling black box optimization problems when the objective is uh, expensive. So that's how we solve the problem, or approximately solve the problem. Uh, and again, this is, uh, th these are just examples of um, uh, exploration schedules. And then this, uh, one more time, uh, uh, but, so yeah, we use the, the glucose example that I've been talking about throughout the, the talk, uh, which are generated, where the glucoses are generated according to this AR2 linear process, and the food and activity are generated IID at each time point. Now that's not all that realistic, right? Food and activity aren't IID, but for the purposes of the simulation, I think it's, 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 that's okay. Okay, and then the reward function is just something that measures how far you are from the normal levels. So it's actually the negative of that, right? You wanna, you wanna be as close as possible to the normal levels. Uh, and we actually, so um, this is an MDP, but we actually treat it when actually making decisions as a contextual bandit. Uh, so we just estimate the myopic optimal policy. We just estimate the uh, expected rewards that you get given um, your, current, your current state in action. Uh, and the reason for this is that uh, we tried um, reinforcement learning methods where we actually look ahead a few steps and th they didn't do any better than, uh, than the contextual bandit strategy. Um, I think one reason, well Susan mentioned earlier that there, there's, there's a um, bias variance trade-off in uh, estimating the long run rewards and sometimes you can, you can win on, on, on variance by just using, doing the myopic thing. And also in this particular case I think it's just a, such a stable system that the myopic performance is a good predictor of the long run performance. So, um, Anyway, that's, that's what we used uh, to make decisions. And then we used Epsilon Greedy. We're also gonna try the other ones as well. Okay, um, so how did we estimate M? Uh, one, we correctly specified the model. Two, we used an incorrectly specified AR1 linear model. And then finally, we used a correctly specified uh, but highly variable non-parametric condi conditional density estimator. Uh, so by correctly specified, I mean it correctly conditions on the past two states, but it's super high variance. Uh, oops, I keep doing that. Uh, and then distributions of food and activity are just estimated by their empirical distributions. And the reason for this is we wanted to study uh, the effects of bias and variance on, uh, in the, the, the estimator of the generative model and performance. Okay, so uh, we, 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 did, we did the algorithm that I described for uh, 25 and 50 time steps with a sample size of 50 patients. Uh, so at each time step, each patient was treated according to uh, the, explore, the estimated optimal exploration strategy at that time. Uh, and then we compared with several fixed epsilon, decay schedules for epsilon uh, uh, as opposed to ones that were tuned. All right, so th th these results I'm showing here are for a time horizon of 25. Uh, so in blue, uh, we can see that when we got the model right, we did uh, significantly better than all of the other methods except AR1 uh, uh, in terms of mean cumulative reward. Uh, uh, AR1 interestingly does basically just as well and the non-parametric, uh, when we estimate the model with a non-parametric conditional density estimator, we do terribly. Uh, uh, systematically worse than all of the ones where we basically, where we more or less pulled the exploration schedule out of the hat, right? Um, so, uh, all right, next, uh, AR2 is doing quite well still, uh, and uh, AR1 loses out a little bit in the longer time horizon. 
and non-parametric conditional density estimator is still quite bad. Proportionally speaking, it's improved a little bit, uh, presumably because it's gotten a little, uh, little help from a larger data set, but uh, it's still among the worst, uh, the worst performing methods here. Um, so uh, the thing that we really want to think about next is, in addition to doing more thorough simulation results, is we need some heuristic for saying the model is just too bad to even try to use for tuning. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I should have. I should have. Um, I should have uh, given some kind of uh, um, uh, rough guide to this. So these are uh, um, uh, the the short story is that it, these are not all that uh, interpretable. So there was the original reward function that they were using was some kind of stepwise thing where I think it was. Um, uh, negative one if you were, um, say, I'm, ju I'm just on the high side, if you were like between 90 and 100, your, your blood glucose, and then like negative two if you were between uh, like 100 and 120, and then negative three if you were higher than that. Right. Uh, the, the reward for an optimal policy would be uh, near zero, but it depends on it depends on where you start, right? So if their glucose starts off high, and I think that we started off these these folks high. Um, so if your glucose starts off high, you're going to uh, you're going to incur some reward no matter what. But then uh, you can learn to stabilize it near the the optimal range. And of course, it's always going to be a little noisy, um, but uh, um, uh, yeah, so I, I, we didn't, we didn't, the way you would fit an optimal policy is just generate a huge amount of data and then fit it to, and fit to that. Um, and we didn't do that as a comparison. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, well, we, uh, we want to, are you saying how quickly it becomes greedy? Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, I know that uh, we looked at some plots of, of what uh, the non-parametric conditional density estimator is doing, and basically it is uh, actually exploring way too much. It, its exploration rate is very high for about half of the task. Um, and then it and then it starts to look look normal. Um, so we know that that's the, that's one reason why it's performing uh, badly. Um, I don't have a I don't I haven't like tried to quantify how quickly um, the uh, the um, well performing models um, go to zero. Yeah. Oh, that's from just standard, that's from uh, many, uh, that's the standard deviation of the means, of the, yeah. Are you saying have we conducted a significance test between, say, negative 25 and 16? Uh, I, we have not looked at the distributions of these rewards and conducted any kind of significance test. No. So we're, we're fairly confident that at least this is better than this, for instance. Okay, so um, all right. So our next step, is, like I said, uh, is to look at these simulation results more thoroughly, because uh, that's sort of something we're like obviously in the middle of, um, and rules for deciding whether the model estimate is even good enough to guide exploration. And so that's actually sort of an, an interesting problem. It's not exactly obvious to me how to how to do that. Um, 
because you also have to specify some baseline that you would default to. And it's not clear to me how to, how to do that, but that's something I'm thinking of. Okay. Uh, but we would also like to, uh, so a lot of folks here are interested in using banded type methods to actually, do, uh, for their explorational, their, their experimental design properties, uh, maybe is the way to say it. Uh, so we would like to modify for uh, those sorts of applications. And of course, um, get some kind of regret analysis um, later on. And, uh, and of course, always open to thinking more about other methods which, uh, which make full use of, uh, fuller use of knowledge about the decision problem, uh, which is what we've tried to do here. Okay, so that's it. Oh, right, so we, um, we were, uh, the actions were insulin or not insulin? Two, yeah. Yeah, so we're running some simulations right now with uh, multi-arm bandits with multiple arms. Uh, <laughs> I'm very uncertain. I don't want to don't want to speculate too much. My guess is that more arms just makes it harder to get a good estimate of the model, and that if your model's crap, then we've seen that uh, we have some evidence that the tuning procedure doesn't really help that much. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, we, so we use a, uh, we use this non parametric estimator of the conditional reward. Oh, the generative model, right. So uh, are you saying this is unrealistic? Oh, yeah. So this, um, this model, this, uh, this generative model um, may or may not be realistic. So this is, uh, this is, I think, what these authors originally fit to it. And then some other folks have been using this model um, to study uh, infinite horizon sequential decision making, so so I just yes yeah so I just I just ran with this model yeah I, I haven't analyzed these these data myself but sure I mean um, getting getting the simulations as realistic as possible is is would be a good thing yeah this is also not a realistic assumption. Epsilon depend on the context. No, not here. No. Um, yeah, I would, I would, I would wager that someone's looked into that. But uh, um, so you might be somehow more sure about certain regions of your state space and then want to explore less. Um, I don't like epsilon G greedy generally, so that seems like a crude way to do that. But in general, it does seem like something you want to do is account for your, uh, your knowledge that, that you know more about certain areas of the state space than others. Yeah, so. Thanks.